Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Shabbat Service for Waymaker Messianic Jewish and Christian Center USA. We welcome everyone who is here with us today. And for those who are listening later on the archives as well, we pray that this is a blessing to each and every one of you. Well, this is the recording for Saturday, March 9th, 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. And on the Hebrew calendar, it is a Dar 1 or a Dar Aleph. Aleph being the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the 29th day, and the year is 5784. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. Well, I have a couple announcements for this upcoming week. Of course, tomorrow evening, we're going to have Rosh Kadesh services, and we're going to be uh, bringing in Rosh Kadesh Adar 2, or a Darbet, which is the second letter of the alphabet in Hebrew. Um, lots going on with that. And of course, uh, uh, we will have Holy Communion also tomorrow evening. Now, as far as the Bible studies, we are going to be reading from Leviticus chapters 11 to 20 in both. Um, the main Bible study, which is the New American Standard Bible, and also in one of the additional Bible studies, the Tanakh. So we'll be reading the same scriptures. The Passion Translation, we are going to be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 1 to 14. Uh, so we will be now getting into the New Testament. And with every new book, uh, of course, there's an introduction in the Passion Translation. So that's pretty much the week. And of course, if you are involved in the class Hearing from God, we meet Tuesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on our dedicated free conference call.com channel. So that's pretty much um, our announcements for this week. So we're going to open with our opening prayer and invite the Holy Spirit in to lead us and guide us and then get Shabbat service underway. Alina Malkino, our Father, our King, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for every day because every day is a gift from you. Every day we have breath in our lungs. Every day you lift our heads and give us a new day is a gift. Today in particular is Sabbath. It is the seventh day of the week. It is the day that you sanctified us holy. And we are here to honor you and honor Sabbath. We love you, Father God, and we thank you for this day of rest and that we can rest in you. We ask your Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, direct us, open the eyes of our heart and open the ears of our heart that we may be receptive to what we're hearing this week. Show us, give us fresh revelation. Show us what it is that we need to incorporate into our spirit and our walk with the Lord. Father God, we give you all our thanks and all our praises, and all glory and honor belong to you. And we pray this prayer in the name above all names, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen. Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 8, it says, Remember Yom Shabbat to keep it holy. You are to work six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Shabbat to Adonai your God. In it you shall not do any work, not you, nor your son, your daughter, your male servants, your female servants, your cattle, nor the outsider that is within your gates. For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Thus Adonai blessed Yom Shabbat and made it holy. Say with me now the Lord's greatest commandment. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. And you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. You are to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Find them as a sign on your hand. They are to be as frontlets between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And Yeshua stated, the second greatest commandment was this, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Torah 
and prophets hang on these two commandments. The Amida standing before God. We're going to say three of the blessings, and the first blessing is the patriarch. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, God most high, who bestows loving kindness and creates all who remembers the kindnesses of the fathers and brings a redeemer to their descendants for the sake of his name. In love, King, helper, savior, and shield. Blessed are you, Adonai, shield of Abraham. And the second blessing is God's might. You are mighty forever, Lord, giving life to the dead. Great is your saving power. He sustains the living with steadfast love and with great compassion gives life to the dead. He upholds the fallen, heals the sick, sets the captives free, and keeps faith with those who sleep, sleep in the dust. Who is like you, Master of Might, and who can compare with you, O King, who brings death, restores life, and causes salvation to flourish? You are faithful to revive the dead. Blessed are you, Adonai, who gives life to the dead. The third blessing is Kedusha, and that means holiness. You are holy, and your name is holy, and holy ones praise you every day. Blessed are you, Adonai, the holy God. Matavu, how lovely. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, and your dwellings, O Israel. Because of your great loving kindness, I will bow down toward your holy temple in awe of you. Adonai, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. As for me, I will bow and worship. I will kneel before Adonai, my maker. As for me, my prayer to you, Adonai, is a time of favor, O God, in your great love. Answer me with the truth of your salvation. In Etzkayim, the tree of life declaration, we say this of the Torah. It is a tree of life to those who grasp it, and happy are those who cling to it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are shalom. Bring us back to you, Adonai, and we will return. Renew our days as of old. Bayam Hahu in that day. And it is said Adonai will then be king over all the earth. In that day Adonai will be a Kahab and his name a Kahab. May God's great name be magnified and sanctified on man in the world that he created. By his will and may he establish his kingdom, cause salvation to sprout. And may he bring the Messiah closer, amen, in your lifetime and in your days and within the lifetime of the entire house of Israel speedily and soon and say amen. May his great name be blessed forever and ever, blessed and praised, glorified and exalted, extolled and honored, uplifted and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be he who is beyond all blessing and song, praise and consolation, consolation spoken in the world and say amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life upon us and upon all Israel and say amen. May he who makes peace in his heights make peace upon us and upon all Israel, and say, Amen. And the blessing of Messiah, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Neten Lanu Devar HaKayim, Mashiach Yeshua. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of life, Messiah Yeshua. Say with me now Messiah's prayer. Our Father in heaven, sanctified be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen and in the ancient days the high priest sounded the shofar to gather benaya israel to worship we're going to sound a shofar now In a moment, I'm going to pause it for you to, to listen to praise and worship. We do praise and worship, but I don't incorporate it in these recordings. When we started doing recordings, there was many, many issues. So we kind of stayed away from that um, and we'll continue to stay away from it for other reasons as well, which I'm just about to go into. Um, what I usually do is I post to social media platforms. I will post uh, the, the, the scriptures and then I will post a series of songs, which can be used for part one. Uh, and also then I will post part one and part two of Shabbat service for both YouTube and Rumble. And then another series of songs, which can be used for part two 
of Shabbat service. Now, of course, if you have your own praise and worship that you prefer to listen to, that is that is fine. Uh, we just need to to mention here, praise and worship is one of the most important elements in any service. We were created to praise and worship our Creator. So yes, uh, we do. Just because it's not incorporated in this recording, uh, we we still do praise and worship because it is so vital. So there's another reason why I do it the way that I do it. And <laughs> I know there's a lot of posts that go on on the social media platforms. Believe me, I'm the one posting them. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is if I would incorporate, now that they're allowing that to happen with a little disclaimer, if I would incorporate the music into this recording, credit is not going to where credit is due. I mean, yes, I would make mention of who the artist is, but they would not get the YouTube view, and that's not fair. So, um, actually, it's their music; it's what they're doing for the kingdom, and it's it's a very it's a very easy way that we can support them. So, by clicking on from the social media platform uh, to that particular song that you want to listen to, it will redirect you right to the artist's YouTube channel. And they will get credit, which they should. It's their song. Many of them, this is their calling for the kingdom. This is what they do for a living. And we certainly don't want to take away from that. Um, we want to actually support them as much as we can. Uh, they're doing an awesome job for the kingdom and bringing us anointing, anointed music. So while you're there on their YouTube channel, if you have clicked on from any one of my posts, uh, take a look around, listen to more. Um, also, many of them have ministries of their own, um, praise and worship ministries that you can certainly support if you're able to. Um, they Some of them do take donations. And also, many of them have hyperlinks, in, uh, which will lead you to where you can purchase their music. So if you if you are able to, to support them in those means, by all means do so. Um, that's what keeps them going. And keeps them being able to bring us the wonderful music that they do. So we need to support them. These are our brothers and sisters out there doing a tremendous job for the kingdom as far as praise and worship goes. But even just listening on their YouTube channel is supporting them. Uh, it's giving them their views. So that's why we do uh, things the way that, that we do and we'll probably continue to do so. So with that being said, I'm going to pause it right here. You can pause it and then hit play when you're when you're done and ready to uh, go on to the Torah portion. When you come back and hit play, we will do the Torah portion for this week and the half Torah portion for part one. Then what we will do is take a break. And there will be a part two, and that will be the Brit Kadashah, the New Covenant, and um, an altar call. And then we'll close out Shabbat service for this week. We've got a lot. Uh, for part two as far as scriptures go uh, this week. So with that being said, I'm going to pause it. Okay, um, this week is Parashat Vakayal, uh, and that means an assemble or an he assembled. Um, some years, depending now this year, of course, we've got two months of Adar. Uh, generally, when it's just one month, uh, a lot of times Vakayel and Pekka Day, which will be next week, uh, are actually a double uh, parashat. We, we, on on non-leap years, we have a lot of double parashats. Um, but no, these two are split up. So we have Vakayel this week um, and then Pekka Day next week. So Vakayel is translated to an assemble or end he assembled. And the Torah portion is Exodus chapter 35, verse 1 to 38 verse 20. Now remember where um, the actual tabernacle is is being readied and the priests have been being sanctified and, and, and all. This is what's actually happening um, in this, in these next um, chapters. The readiness uh, God has given uh, Moses uh, instructions. Now he's taking it to the people, going to take an offering uh, for the tabernacle. The tabernacle will be uh, becoming uh, constructed. Uh, holy garments will be made for Aaron, who will be the high priest, and his sons, who are also priests. 
So you'll be seeing all of that unfold. So so the next couple of weeks, we're going to be really focused on um, getting that tabernacle ready for worship and um, for service. Chapter 35, the offerings for the tabernacle. Then Moses assembled all the congregation of Adonai Israel and said to them, these are the words which Adonai commanded you to do. Work is to be done for six days, but the seventh day is a holy day for you, a Shabbat of complete rest to Adonai. Whoever does any work then will die. Do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on Yom Shabbat. So this is, again, reiterated to the to the people how important Shabbat is. And we know that God, when he went about creation, did all of his work in six days and rested on the seventh. So he gave us that perfect example. Moses also said to all the congregation of B'nai Israel, this is the word which Adonai commanded, saying, take from among you an offering for Adonai. Whoever has a willing heart, let him bring Adonai's offering, gold, silver, or bronze, purple, a blue purple, I'm sorry, and scarlet cloth, fine linen and goat hair, ram skins dyed red, seal skins and acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastplate. So this is a free will offering. But remember, um, when um, they spoiled the Egyptians as they were leaving, these were the things that, that, that were gathered, that they gathered. And now they're being asked to, you know, whoever has a willing heart to give of these things as an offering. Let every wise hearted man among you come and make everything that Adonai has commanded, including the tabernacle, its tent and its coverings, its clasp and its boards, the cross boards, its pillars and its bases, the ark and the poles, the atonement cover for the curtain screen, the tables and its poles with all of its utensils along with the bread of the presence. Also the menorah for light with its utensils, its lamps and the oil for the light, the altar of incense and its poles, the anointing oil, the sweet incense, and the screen for the entrance of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its grafting of bronze, its poles, and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the courtyard, the pillars and their bases, and the curtain for the gate of the courtyard, the pegs of the tabernacle and of the courtyard along with the, their cords, the woven garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the Kohen and for his sons to minister as Kohenim. Then all the congregation of Benai Israel departed from before Moses. Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit was willing came and brought Adonai's offering for the work of the tent of meeting and for all its services as well as for the holy garments. So they came, both men and women, everyone whose heart compelled him and brought nose rings, earrings, signet rings, bracelets, and all kinds of golden jewels, everyone who brought a wave offering of gold to Adonai, everyone who, who had blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat hair, ram skins, dyed red or seal skins, brought them. Everyone who can make a contribution or of silver or bronze brought Adonai's offering. And every man who had had a case of one of any used use for service brought it. Also, of all the women who were wise-hearted, spun with their their hands, they also brought uh, what they had woven: the blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen. I'm sorry. All the all the women whose heart stirred them up with wisdom spun the goat hair. Also, the leaders brought onyx stones and settings for the ephod and for the breastplate, along with the spice for the, with the oil for the light and for the anointing and for the sweet incense. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing gave toward all the work that Adonai had commanded to be done by Moses' hand. So Benai Israel brought it as a free will offering to Adonai. Now, even though this people actually sinned and they made that golden calf, they had a willing heart. They they loved God, um, and and they wanted to do their part, and gave very very generously. Actually, then Moses said to Benai Israel, "See, Adonai has called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. He just filled him with the ruach of God, 
the Ruach is the spirit, the spirit of God, with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge in all manner of craftsmanship to make in, ingenious designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, as well as cutting gemstones for setting wood carving to make all kinds of skillful craftsmanship. He has also placed in his heart the ability to teach both he and Aholiab, son of Ahizamath, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with wisdom of heart to, to forge all the works of an engraver, an artisan, and an embroiderer in blue, purple, scarlet, and in fine linen, as well as weaving. They can perform every craft and in ingenious designs. Chapter 36, More Than Enough. So Bezalel and Aholiab are to work, along with every wise-hearted man in whom Adonai has placed insight and understanding to know how to perform all the labor for the service of the sanctuary, according to everything Adonai has commanded. Then Moses called Bezalel, Aholiab, and all the wise-hearted men, in whose minds Adonai had set wisdom, along with everyone whose heart stirred him up, to come to the work. They received from Moses the entire offering that Benai Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to build it. They brought free will offerings to him morning after morning. Then all the skilled men who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came one by one from the work he was doing and said to Moses, The people are bringing much more than enough for the work of this construction that Adonai has commanded to be done. So Moses gave an order and they proclaimed it throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary, so the people were restrained from bringing more, for the work material they had was sufficient for all the work, with much left over. So that tells you how how freely they, the people were giving of their heart. Their hearts were stirred. So the wise-hearted men among them did the work. They made the tabernacle with ten curtains of finely twisted linen, along with blue, purple, and scarlet with cherubim, the work of a skilled craftsman. The length of each curtain was 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain was 4 cubits. All the curtains had one measure. Then he coupled five curtains to one another, and the other five curtains he also coupled together. He made blue loops on the edge of the curtain that was outermost within the first set. He did the same along the edge of the curtain that was outermost in the second set. He made 50 loops in one curtain and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that was in the second set so that the loops were opposite to one another. Also he made fifty clasps of gold and coupled the curtains one to another with the clasp so the tabernacle was one. Then he made curtains from goat hair for a tent over the tabernacle. He made eleven curtains. The length of each curtain was thirty cubits and the width of each was four cubits. The eleven curtains had one measure. He coupled five curtains by themselves and six other curtains by themselves. He made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that was outermost in the first set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that was outermost in the second set. Also, he made 50 bronze clasps to couple the tent together so that it would be one. Then he made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red along with the covering of seal skins above. He also made the framework of boards for the tabernacle from a king's seal wood standing upright. The length of a board was 10 cubits, the width was a cubit and a half. Each board had two supports joined one to another. He did this for all the boards of the tabernacle. So he built the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards from the south side southward. And he made 40 silver base, bases under the 20 boards, two bases under one board for its two supports and two bases under another board for its two supports. Also for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, he made 20 boards along with their 40 silver bases, two under one board and two under the next for the back part of the tabernacle westward, he made six boards. He also made two boards for the corners of the tabernacle in the back so that they could be doubled underneath and in the same way to be fixed to the top of the first ring. He did this for both of them at the two corners so there were eight boards along with their silver bases. 16 in all, two under each board. Then he made crossbars from acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, and five crossbars for the boards of the tabernacle for the back part westward. He built the middle crossbar bar 
to pass through in the center of the boards from one end to the other. He overlaid the boards with gold and made golden rings for them as holders for the crossbars and overlaid the crossbars with gold. Then he made the curtain of blue, purple, scarlet, and finely twisted linen along with the cherubim. The work of a skillful craftsman. He made four pillars of acacia and overlaid them with gold, having golden cups, and he cast four silver bases for them. Then he made a parquet. And the word parquet means uh, it's the dividing curtain in the temple for the Holy of Holies. It's that, that curtain um, that divided the holy place from the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies is where the Shekinah glory of God dwelled uh, above the mercy seat. And um, only, only the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, could enter there. So the parquet is that dividing curtain for the entrance of the tent of blue, purple, scarlet, and plainly twisted linen, the work of a color weaver. Also, he made the five pillars with their hooks and overlaid their capitals and bands with gold along with their five bronze bases. So now we're going on to chapter 37, the ark, the table, menorah, and incense altar. Bezalel also made the ark from acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold inside and out. He made a crown of gold for it all around. He cast four golden rings for it in the four feet, two rings on the one side and two on the other side. He also made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. Then he put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. Now. This is a little uh, spoiler alert, too. There were specific instructions on who was to carry the ark and how the ark was to be carried. And, you know, as we're, as we're reading ahead um, in our Bible studies, when we get to the part, the story of King David, and when he wanted to have the ark brought into the city of David, um, the correct people were not carrying it and actually... Someone ended up getting <laughs> fried on the spot uh, because they weren't carrying it. Um, the, actually, the ox stumble and they reach out, they touch the ark where they're not supposed to touch it, and 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 there is someone that loses their life as a result. Um, and then they had to learn that they forgot all these things, and they they had to learn that there was specific the specific people um, from the Levite tribe that had to be the ones to carry it and they had to carry it in a specific way and there were areas that could not be touched so that's all i'm going to touch on that at this point but um so we'll continue here he made an atonement cover of pure gold two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide then he forged two cherubim of gold from hammered work at the two ends of the atonement cover one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other he made the atonement cover from a single piece with with the cherubim on the two ends. So the cherubim spread out their wings on high, overshadowing the atonement cover with their wings, with their faces to one another, and the faces of, of the cherubim towards the atonement cover. Then he made the table of a case he would two cubits long and a cubit wide and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold and made a golden crown all around. Also he made a border for it a hand width around and made a golden crown for the border all around. He cast four golden rings for it and put the rings into the four corners that were on the four feet. The rings were close to the borders as holders for the poles to carry the table. He also made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold to carry the table. He forged the articles that were on the table, the, the dishes, pans, bowls, and jars with which to pour out of pure gold. And then he made the menorah of pure gold, of hammered work, even its bases, its stem, its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers were one piece, one piece with it. There were six branches going out of the side, three branches out of the one side, and three branches out of the other. Three cups made, made like almond blossoms were in one branch, a bulb within a flower, and three cups made like almond blossoms in the next branch, another bulb within a flower. It was just... So for the six branches going out of the menorah. 
Also within the menorah were four cups made like almond blossoms, bulbs, and flowers, with a bulb under two branches of one piece, a second bulb under two branches of another piece, and a bulb under two branches of a third piece for six branches extending out of it. Their bulbs and their branches were one piece with it and an entire hammered work of pure gold. He also made the seven lamps along with tongues and censers of pure gold. He made them from a talent of pure gold along with all the pieces. He made the altar of incense from a piece of wood, a cubit long and a cubit wide, squared and two cubits high. The horns were one piece with it. Then he overlaid it with pure gold on top, on the sides, all around and over its horns. Also, he made a crown of gold for it all around. He made two golden rings for it, for it underneath the crown on two sides as holders for poles in order to carry it. He made the poles of a case he would and overlaid them with gold. Then he made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of sweet spices, the blend of a perfumer. Chapter 38, the altar for sacrifices. He then made the altar for burnt offering from acacia wood. It was square, five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high. He also made the horns on the four corners from one piece and overlaid it with bronze. Then he made all the utensils for the altar, the pots and the shovels, the basins, the forks, and the fire pans. He made all of the utensils from bronze. Now, some Bibles will say copper. We're reading from the Messianic Jewish Family Bible, True of Life version, and in this version, it's bronze. He also made a bronze grating that for the altar under the ledge around it, reaching halfway up. He cast four rings for the four ends of the bronze grating to be holders for the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. Then he put the poles into the rings on the sides of the altar to carry it, and he made it hollow out of boards. He made the basin and the base from bronze with mirrors from the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he made the courtyard for the south side. The hangings of the courtyard were finely twisted linen, a hundred cubits long. There were twenty pillars and twenty bronze bases. The hooks of the pillars and their bands were silver. Likewise, for the north side, a hundred cubits long with twenty bronze pillars and bases and the hooks for the pillars and their, their bands were silver. For the west side, the hangings were 50 cubits with 10 pillars and their 10 bases, as well as the hooks for the pillars and their silver bands. Likewise, for the east side, 50 cubits long, the hangings for one side of the grate were 15 cubits with three pillars and their bases. Similarly, for the other side, on either side of the gate of the courtyard, were hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three bases. On the hangings of, of the courtyard, all around were finely twisted linen. The bases for the pillars were bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their bands were silver. The overlaying of their capitals were silver. And all the pillars of the courtyard were ringed with silver. The curtain for the gate of the courtyard was the work of a color weaver of blue, purple, scarlet, and finely twisted linen. It was 20 cubits long and 5 cubits high, like the hangings of the courtyard. Their four pillars and four bases were bronze. Their hooks, along with the overlaying of the capitals and their bands, were silver. All the pegs of the tabernacle and the courtyard all around were bronze. And that is the end of our Torah portion for this week. We're going to uh, quickly do a recap and then we're going to do our half Torah portion. So in the last parashat, Anani instructed Moses how to make the Mishkan, the tabernacle, its vessels, offerings, and the priestly garments. Now this week opens with Moses calling for public assembly of the entire community of Israel. And at this assembly, he relays to them what God told him on the mountain. Uh, the Hebrew word vakayel, meaning to assemble, convene, or gather, is related to kahal, k-h-a-l, meaning assembly, convocation, and congregation. The word kahila, which is K-E-H-I-L-L-A, is a derivative word, and that can mean community. Most Messianic congregations refer to themselves as a kahila, which is K-E-H-I-L-L-A, rather than church, since that word is not derived from Hebrew. So let's 
than a week earlier, this Israelite community that assembled before Moses had worshipped the golden calf. And now Moses instructs them in the ways of Adonai. The first instruction Moses gives them uh, is concerning the Sabbath, which God set apart as a day of holiness, elevating it above the rest of the week. And on this day, no work was to be done. The commandment to keep the Sabbath is so important in the Torah that anyone found working on this holy day would receive the death penalty in, back in ancient days. There were two words for work in, in Hebrew, avodah, and that's A-V-O-D-A-H, and melakah, A-M-A-L-E-K-A-H. And the one used in this passage does not typically mean physical exertion. Melika, um, traditionally interpreted as the 39 different categories of work that went into building the, the Mishkan the, or the tabernacle, is the type of work specified in Exodus chapter 35, verse 2. Although there is some degree of interpretation regarding what type of work uh, Melika indicates, the Bible specifically forbids some types of outright lighting a fire and carrying a burden um, on the Sabbath. Um, essentially, Melika is constructive, creative work that involves producing, making, or creating anything that demonstrates humankind's mastery over nature. Abadah is also work, but often in the form of cultivating or performing service, whether free or slave. Now, Abadah, like, like what the priests did, um, the, the, the service to God is Avada. Okay. So therefore, both Avada and Melaka are mentioned as forbidden on Shabbat. Perhaps no society on earth today would impose the death penalty for violating, violating this, this Sabbath, but the command to keep it holy still does stand. Um, it is the, the seventh day, and it is Sabbath on a Saturday. The Bible defines the Sabbath on the seventh day as Friday evening to Saturday evening, not the first or any other day of the week. This is the definition coming from the Bible. So Sunday, sorry, it's just the first day of the week. It's okay that you, you honor God on a Sunday, but the real Sabbath is Friday evening to Saturday evening. Nothing in the Bible commands the Sabbath to be kept on any other day. Because of that, it is clear that we simply do not have the authority to change God's holy days. And that also goes with, and I'm going to tell you this ahead of time, at the end of March, we are not celebrating Resurrection Sunday like the world church is doing. That is not God's timetable. We, are, we will definitely celebrate it after Passover when it is appropriate. Um, now, to those who do not know any better at this point, that's okay. We're not going to rebuke you. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be enough of that that goes on in social media. We don't get involved in all of that. You know, people will come to the the revelation knowledge as God presents it to them. So we're not going to uh, rebuke people and put them down for for celebrating for celebrating it because in their hearts they are celebrating Yeshua. And that's okay. You can celebrate Yeshua any day, but it is incorrect to celebrate it at the end of March, just to let people know that, because you can't even reconcile that. If Yeshua is our Passover lamb, Passover is not going to occur until the end of April. You can't reconcile it. I don't know how, well, I do know how this uh, got all separated, and it's really a shame, and only Yeshua will bring this all back together. It's how the, how, how the, the Gentile church got separated from um, actually the Jewish believers too, who were who were keeping the feasts, um, but and following what Jesus actually taught. Um, so, and that's what we do. We're sticking to God's timeline. We know that we know the truth, and you know, we're not going to do anything otherwise. Um, we're just following God's timeline. So just so you know. Um, we will have a Resurrection Sunday, even though actually First Fruits uh, is correct with the orth when the Orthodox do celebrate that on Nisan 16. Um, that is really First Fruits, um, but um, in keeping with Yeshua arose on the first day of the week, which 
is our Sunday. And we're going to do that. And I know there's a lot of other Messianic uh, congregations that are doing the same. And um, so just to let you know and remind you that don't be alarmed at the end of March when you don't see it on the calendar. In fact, I, I do have a calendar for March that I am going to post. I do need to get April's calendar together. I'd like to do them side by side if possible. So just to let you know, um, don't be alarmed. But it is coming next month when it is appropriate. Okay. According to Daniel, that would constitute acting in the spirit of anti-Messiah who would seek to change the times and the laws. So if we change God's holy days to fit in with the world, as in, you know, Daniel 7, chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 25 says, He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a times, times and a half a time. So we have no authority to change God's laws and to change God's holy days. They are set. You know, Nisan 14 is Nisan 14. That's always the Sabbath. Now, yes, we follow a Gregorian calendar, which is not God's timeline. So we do, you know, but the world follows it. So we are following it too. Uh, but we need to be aware that's not God's timeline. It is generally acknowledged that the reason many, many Christians keep Sunday instead of Saturday is because of the Roman Catholic Church changed the day to Sunday, believing it had authority to do so. And it also may have to do with the sun god. Um, so people need to be careful. Um, but I'm not, again, going to get into that because that could get really ugly. Um, the basics, you know, the basis is that, that you believe in the same God and the same Yeshua who died for all of us. So, um, well, there were just two, two quotes from the Catholic publications reflecting this stance. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the church and the Council of Laodicea in 364 AD transferred the solemnity to Sunday. They took it upon themselves to change God's holy day. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the, and they said the church is above the Bible. Um, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that. That was a Catholic record of London, Ontario, published in 1923. I don't think so. <laughs> okay, anyway, so that tells you where this came from. So, not a good thing. We are not above God, and the Bible, uh, you know, the church is not above the Bible to make its own rules. That's how it came about. So, anyway, the observance of the Shabbat is often perceived um, to some as burdensome. Those, however, who do keep it, sincerely seeking the Lord, experience wonderful rest and great joy on this day. Yes, that's true. Even Yeshua and his disciples kept Shabbat, and the Brit Kedeshah states that it was his custom to be in the synagogue on that day, a custom shared by Paul. Yeshua never spoke against keeping the Shabbat and completely acknowledged it, calling himself the Lord of the Shabbat. There were a few situations in which Yeshua's commitment to Torah and the Sabbath were called into question by the religious leaders of his day, and he took these opportunities to address some errors in the way the commandment was being applied. Remember also, there was an oral interpretation, and there's some things that we, you know, yes, Yeshua was trying to straighten out as well. And he would know. He was the word became flesh. For instance, one day when Yeshua's disciples were walking through the grain fields on Shabbat, they picked heads of grain to eat because they were hungry. The Pharisees objected to this because reaping is considered malakha, that, that type of work. Therefore, they accused the disciples of breaking the Shabbat, saying, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And of course, the disciples were not picking grain for the purpose of harvesting. They were simply satisfying immediate hunger. And Yeshua essentially rebuked them, pointing to the fact that David and his companions entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread when they were suffering from extreme hunger. In the Jewish understanding of the Shabbat, one should feast on this day. In fact, the only time Jewish law permits fasting on Shabbat is on Yom Kippur at the Day of Atonement, which we all do fast for that. 
Yeshua also pointed out that the priests are not guilty of breaking the Sabbath when they do their appointed work in the temple. The avada, so working in the temple, when when we do service on Saturday, well, well we got to look at that too. So immediately after this discussion, Yeshua entered the synagogue and saw a man with a withered hand. He was then asked if it was lawful to heal on this Sabbath. And he answered, what man is there among you who has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You're not going to let somebody suffer. If you see somebody, uh, you know, if, if there's an accident, you're not going to stop because it's a Sabbath? No. And this is what he's saying. Although Pharisaic Judaism might have been divided on this issue during the time of Yeshua, this principle that Yeshua is teaching here actually became Jewish law and is taught today in Orthodox Judaism. For that reason, um, so emergency services do run on Shabbat um, in Israel. It is a principle of Jewish law that preserving human life overrides virtually any other religious consideration. Therefore, for instance, if a sidewalk is icy on Shabbat, putting down salt, though it is considered work, is encouraged to prevent injury. So it's using, using your common sense there with that. That's not breaking Shabbat. So um, with the command to keep the Sabbath reiterated, to the people, Moses calls for a free will offering of the materials needed for the construction of the tabernacle and a free will offering, a taruma, which is different from the tithe, uh, which in Hebrew um, is ma ma'aser, from the Hebrew word eser, which is E-S-E-R, meaning ten. Um, while this offering went above and beyond their regular tithe, there was no set amount. It was to be whatever the Lord put on their hearts, but that did not result in a small offering. Indeed, God stirred up the hearts of the people so much to bring their offerings for the work of the Lord to such a degree that the people liberally, liberal, liberally donated building materials. So true was their spirit of generosity that they gave more than enough. Moses actually commanded them to stop giving. Um, the Torah uses the word haveo, which is H-E-V-E-I-U. They brought nine times in reference to the generous outpourings of precious, costly gifts. So the outpouring of gifts may have been motivated by a lingering guilt of guilt over the golden calf incident, but some some rabbis teach that. Um, however, it was on their heart to please the Lord. So that is a good thing. And God loves a cheerful giver and promises to provide abundantly in response. Um, in order to keep the kingdom of God, which was visually represented in building the tabernacle, the Lord desires that our offerings be freely given with a joyful heart and to in sincere motives to see his work be done on earth as it is in heaven. With the generous donations of the people on hand, God anointed wise-hearted artisans to make the tabernacle and its furnishing. This dwelling place where God included a hundred silver sockets for the foundation, 48 gold covered wall panels, three layers of roof covering the veil with a parquet um, between the holy place and the most holy place, the ark and menorah, the table and its showbread, and all the other furnishings that were detailed in uh, Parashat Taruma, Tetzava, and Kitiza. For this sacred task, a master craftsman was chosen, Bezalel, whose name means in God's shadow. Bezalel is descended from the powerful tribe of Judah, which represents royalty and rulership. He is filled with the spirit of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to build the divine sanctuary. Underst uh, okay, in, in Hebrew, understanding, or binah, B-I-N-A-H, and build, bone, B-O-N-E-H, are derived from the same Hebrew root, B hyphen N hyphen H. In fact, scriptures tell us that we all need wisdom and understanding to build our house. Bezalel was fully equipped by Adonai, Adonai to complete the task before him. We also have good works that God has appointed us to accomplish in our lifetime, and God will equip us with whatever we need to accomplish them. Whatever it is, is our calling. Um, 
God will empower us and equip us with what we need. All we need to do is lean in on God and allow him to show us. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to go into our half Torah portion. Um, and actually, there's two areas that we're going to read from. And first is First uh, Kings chapter 7, verses 1 to 51. Solomon's palace complex. But it took Solomon 13 years to build and complete his own palace. He also built the forest house of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Built on four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams upon the pillars. It was paneled with cedar above the side chambers, which were on 45 pillars, 15 in a row. And there were window frames in three rows with window opposite window in three ranks. And all the doorways had rectangular framing with window opposite to window in three tiers. He also made a portico of columns, 50 cubits long and 50 cubits wide with a porch in front. And in front of that were pillars and overhanging and an overhanging roof. He also made the hall of the throne where he would judge the hall of justice that was paneled with cedar from the floor to the ceiling. His house where he would dwell sat farther back of the hall was of the same construction. He also made a house like the hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom Solomon had taken to wife. All these were made of expensive stones, stone cut to size and sawed with saws inside and outside from the foundation to the top and from the outside to the great court. The foundation was also made of expensive stones, huge stones, stones eight cubits and stones ten cubits. All, all above were expensive stones cut to measure and cedar wood. The surrounding great courtyard had three rows of cut stone and a row of cedar beams. The same as the inner court of the house of Adonai and the portico of the house. Now Hiram, the bronze craftsman, King Solomon, sent for and had Hiram brought from Tyre. He was a widow's son from the tribe of Naphtali, while his father was a man of Tyre, a coppersmith, and he was filled with wisdom, understanding, and skill to do any work in bronze. So he came to King Solomon and executed all his work. He fashioned the two bronze pillars, 18 cubits high and 12 cubits in circumference each. He also made two capitals of molten bronze to set upon the tops of the pillars. The height of each capital was five cubits. Nettings of lattice work and twisted threads of chain work for the capitals were on top of the pillars, seven for the one capital and seven for the other. So he made the pillars with the two rows of pomegranates all around the netting covering the capitals on top of each capital. The capitals that were on the top of the pillars in the portico were of lily design, four cubits high. So also the capitals and the two pillars close to the belly next to the netting were the pomegranates and rows of 200 around both capitals. Thus, he set up the pillars of the porticos of the temple. He set up the right pillar and named it Zakim, And he set up the left pillar and named it Boaz. On the top of the pillars was lily design. So the work of the pillars was finished. Next, he made the sea of cast metal, 10 cubits across from brim to brim, circular in form, 5 cubits in its height and 30 cubits in its circumference under its brim. There were gourds encircling it, 10 per cubit, completely surrounding the sea. The gourds were cast in two rows in one piece with it. It stood on 12 oxen, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. And the sea was set on top of them and all their rear parts were inward. It was a hand breadth thick, and its brim was made like the brim of a cut, like the petals of a lily. It held 11,000 gallons. Then he made 10 bases of bronze. The length of each base was four cubits, the width four cubits, and height three cubits. The structure of the bases were as follows. They had borders and borders between the frames, and on the borders that were below the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. On the frames there was a pedestal manor above, and beneath the lions and oxen were wreaths of hanging work. Each base had four bronze wheels with bronze axles. Its four legs had brackets. The brackets were beneath the labor, cast with a wreath at each side. Its opening inside the crown at the top was a cubit high, and its openings was round, like the design of a pedestal, a cubit and a half. And also on its openings were engravings, and their borders were square, not round. The four wheels were underneath the borders, and the axles of the wheels were in the base. The height of a wheel was a cubit and a half, 
and the structure of the wheel was like the structure of a chariot wheel. Their axle trees, their rims, their spokes, and their hubs were all its half metal. There were four brackets at the four corners of each base. Each bracket was one piece, and the base itself, on top of the base, there was a band half a cubit high encircling it. Its braces and its borders were part of it, and on the plates of the braces and on its borders, the engraved cherubim, lions, and palm trees, wherever there was clear space around each. With encircling wreath, he made the ten bases like this. All of them cast from the same mold, the same size, and the same shape. Then he made ten basins of bronze. One basin held 220 gallons. Each basin was four cubits, and on each of the ten bases was one basin. And he set up the labor stand, five on the right side of the house and five on the left side of the house, and set up the sea of cast metal on the right side of the house, eastward toward the south. Then Hiram made the basins, the shovels, and the sprinkling bowls. So Hiram finished doing all the work that he performed for King Solomon on at a nice house. The two pillars, the two bowls of the capitals that were on the top of the pillars, the two nettings to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the top of the pillars, the 400 pomegranates for the two nettings, two rows of pomegranates for each to cover the two bowls of the capitals on top of the pillars, the ten bases and the ten basins on the bases and the one sea and the twelve oxen under the sea, the pots, the shovels, and the basins. All these vessels Hiram made for King Solomon in the house of Adonai were made of polished bronze. The king had them cast in the plain of the Jordan with clay of the ground between Sukkot and Zarephan. Solomon left all the vessels of the way because they were too many. The weight of the bronze could not be determined. So Solomon made all the equipment that was to be in the house of Adonai, the golden altar, the table on which was the bread of the presence of gold and menorah, five on the right side and five on the left, in front of the inner sanctuary of pure gold, the flowers, the lamps, the tongs of gold, the cups, the snuffers, the bowls, the wick trimmers, and the fire pans of pure gold, the hinges for the doors of the inner house, the holy of holies, and for the doors of the house, that is, of the temple of gold. This had to be magnificent, that first temple. When all the work that King Solomon did in, in Adonai's house was finished, Solomon brought in the things that his father David had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the vessels, and put them in the treasuries of the house of Adonai. And next we have Ezekiel chapter 1, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 45, verse 1 through 46, verse 24. Levitical land, when you allow the land for inheritance, set apart an offering to Adonai a holy portion of the land. The length will be 25,000. And the width will be 10,000. It will be holy within all its surrounding borders. Out of this, there will be a, a holy place, 500 long by 500 wide square, all around and 50 cubits for the open land surrounding it. From this area, you are to measure a length of 25,000 and a width of 10,000, in which will be the sanctuary, which is most holy. It is to be the holy portion of the land for the Kohen ministering in the sanctuary who draw near to serve. Adonai, it will be a place for their houses as well as a place consecrated for the sanctuary. An area 25,000 long by 10,000 wide will be for the Levites, the ministers of the house. It will be a possession for themselves, 20 chambers. You will give the city possession of an area 5,000 wide by 25,000 long alongside the offering of the holy allotment. It will be for the whole house of Israel. The prince's allotment, the prince will have a portion on either side of the holy allotment of the city's property, adjacent to the holy offering and the city's property, on the west side westward and on the east side eastward, its length will correspond to one of the tribal portions. From the western boundary to the eastern boundary, it will be a land for him as a possession in Israel. My princes will no longer oppress my people. They will give land to the house of Israel according to their tribes. Thus says Adonai Elohim, let it be enough for you, prince of Israel. Get rid of violence and destruction. Execute justice and righteousness. Take away your oppression from my people. It is a declaration of Adonai. You are to have just balances, an honest dry measure, and an honest liquid measure. The dry and liquid measure will be of a uniform measure. The bath will contain a tenth part of a homer, and an ephah a tenth part of a homer. And the standard measure will be the homer. The shekel will be 20 geras, but 
20 plus 25, 15 shekels will be your mina. This is the offering that you are to set apart. A sixth of an ephah out of a homer of wheat, a sixth of an ephah out of a homer of barley, along with a set portion of oil, a bath of oil, as the tithe of the bath for each core, that's K O R, which is ten baths, or a homer, since ten baths are, are a homer, and one lamb of the flock out of two hundred from the well watered pastures of Israel. These are for the grain offering, burnt offering, and fellowship offerings to make atonement for them. It is a declaration of Adonai. All the people of the land must give his contribution to the prince in Israel. It will be the prince's role to give the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings at the feast, new moons, and Shabbatot. In all the modim of the house of Israel, he will prepare the sin offering, the meal offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. Offerings for Moedim. Thus says Adonai Elohim in the first month of in the first day of the month, take a young bull without blemish and purify the sanctuary. The Kohen will take some of the blood of the sin offering and put it upon the doorposts of the house and upon the four corners of the ledge of the altar and upon the posts of the gate of the inner court. So you will do on the seventh day of the month for everyone who sins unintentionally or through ignorance. So you will make atonement for the house. In the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month, you will have the Passover. A feast of seven days when matzah will be eaten. On that day, the prince will prepare a bull as a sin offering for himself and for all the people of the land. He will prepare a burnt offering to Adonai for seven days of the feast, seven bulls and seven rams without blemish daily for seven days, and a male goat daily for sin offering. He will prepare as a grain offering an ephah for a bull, an ephah for a ram, and a pen of oil for each ephah. He will do this in the seventh month on the fifteenth day of the month during the feast. For seven days, for sin offering as well as burnt offering, grain offering as well as oil. Chapter 46 Thus says Adonai Elohim, the gate of the inner court that faces the east will be shut for the six working days. On Yom Shabbat it will be opened, and in the day of the new moon it will be opened. The prince will enter by the way of the porch of the gate from outside and stand by the post of the gate. Then the Kohen will prepare his burnt offering and his fellowship offering. He will worship at the threshold of the gate and then go out. The gate will not be shut until the evening. The people of the land will worship at the door of that gate before Adonai on Shabbatot and new moons. The burnt offering that the prince offers to Adonai on Yom Shabbat will be six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish. The grain offering will be an ephah for the ram. The grain offering for the lambs will be a gift of his hand and a hen of oil for an ephah. On the day of the new moon, it will be a young bull without blemish, six lambs, and a ram. They must be without blemish. Now we're going to be bringing in Rosh Kadesh tomorrow evening. Um, he will prepare a grain offering, and this was what was to be done. Okay, He will prepare a grain offering, an ephah for the bull, and an ephah for the ram for the lambs, whatever his hand may reach, and a hen of oil for an ephah. When the prince enters, he will enter by way of the porch of the gate, and he will also exit by that way. When the people of the land come before Adonai at the Moedim, whoever enters by way of the north gate will worship by with will exit by way of the south gate. Whoever enters by way of the south gate must exit by way of the north gate. He should not return by the way of the gate where he came in, since he must exit straight ahead. When they enter, the prince will come in among them. When they go out, they will go out together. At the feast in the Moedim, the grain offering will be an ephah for a bull and an ephah for a ram and for the lamb, a gift of his hand and a pin of oil for an ephah. Now, if the prince prepares a freewill offering, burnt offering, or fellowship offering as a freewill offering to Adonai, the gate for him facing east must be opened for him. Then he will prepare his burnt offering and his fellowship offerings as he does on Yom Shabbat. Then he will go out. After he exits, the gate should be shut. You are to prepare a lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering to Adonai daily. Morning by morning you are to prepare it. Also, you will prepare a grain offering with it morning by morning, a sixth of an ephah and a third of a head of oil to moisten the fine flour, a grain offering to Adonai continually. It is a perpetual statute. They will prepare the lamb, the grain offering, and the oil morning by morning for continual burnt offering. Thus says Adonai Elohim, if the prince gives an offering, 
to any of his sons as his inheritance, it will belong to his sons. It will be their possession by inheritance. But if he gives of his inheritance as a gift to one of his servants, it will be his until the year of liberty when it, it will revert to the prince. His inheritance will be long to his sons. The prince must not take from the people inheritance, evicting them wrongfully out of their property. He must give inheritance to his sons out of his own property so that my people will not be displaced, anyone from his own property. Then he brought me through the entrance that was on, at the side of the gate into the holy chambers for the Kohanim looking north. Behold, there was a place at the far western end. He said to me, this is the place where the Kohanim will boil the guilt offering and this sin offering where they will bake the grain offering so they do not bring them into the outer court to consecrate the people. Then he brought me out to the outer courtyard and led me past the four corners of the courtyard. Behold, in every corner of the courtyard, there was another courtyard. And in four corners of the courtyard, there was a closed court, 40 cubits long by 30 wide. These four in the corners had the same size. There was a row of masonry surrounding them, surrounding the four. Boiling places were built under the surrounding rows. He said to me, these are the boiling places where the ministers of the house will boil the sacrifices of the people. So that is the end of our half Torah portion. So again, in um, the Torah portion, Moses assembled the people of Israel, reiterated to them the commandment to observe the Shabbat. He then conveys Adonai's instructions regarding the making of the tabernacle and the people donate the required materials in abundance bringing gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, red dyed wool, goat, goat hair, spun linen, animal skins, wood, olive oil, herbs, and precious stones. Moses tells them to, had to tell them to actually stop giving. And a team of wise-hearted artisans makes the furnishings the, and, the, and the mishkan, the tabernacle. Um, and it was detailed in the previous Torah readings in Torah Ma, Tetzava, and Kitiza. Three layers of roof coverings, 48 plated wall panels, and 100 silver foundation sockets. The parquet, which is the veil that separates between the sanctuary's two chambers of the holy place and the holy of holies. And the screen that fronts it, the ark and its cover with the cherubim and the table and its showbread, the seven branch menorah with, with its specially prepared oil, the golden altar, and the incense burned on it, the anointing oil, the outdoor altar for burnt offerings, and all its implements, the hangings, the posts, and foundation sockets for the courtyard, and the basin and its pedestal made out of copper, copper or bronze mirrors. And we know there's an outside court. There's uh, where where the altar, where the brazen altar and the labor was, where those sacrifices were done. There's the holy place and the holy of holies. Now, also we. This was more um, also Ezekiel, what we read in Ezekiel dealt with uh, a lot of this and the services. Uh, Kings um, chapter 7, uh, we saw that uh, Solomon's, Solomon's palace was built and also, also the construction of several components of the Holy Temple by a craftsman, Hiram of Tyre. So that kind of parallels the Torah portion which describes the construction of the tabernacle by Bezalel and his crew of craftspeople. King Solomon called for Hiram, uh, an expert, a coppersmith, to create the copper columns to flank the largest doorway of the Holy Temple. The temple was fashioned in the same way as the tabernacle was. It was stationary where the tabernacle, they packed it up and moved uh, with it. The columns were 18 cubits, approximately 30 feet high, and were topped by two capitals, which were intricately carved with pomegranates and palm, palm leaves. The right column was named Jacob, and the left, Boaz. Hiram also built a copper basin, or sea. It's called in the text. It stood on 12 oxen, three looking towards the north, and three looking towards the west, three looking towards the south, and three looking towards the east. And the sea was set upon them above, and all the hinder parts were inward. In this basin, a large mikvah, um, the priests would immerse before they served in the temple. And that is the end of our Torah and half Torah portion. We are going to uh, close out with prayer and then take a break and come back for part two. Father God, we want to thank you. 
for this Torah and half Torah portion, we see how worship, the places of worship were, were actually constructed and how you breathe that craftsmanship into certain people and we see in the half tour how how it was also uh, paralleled um, how the tabernacle was very similar to the temple and now we who are born again uh, how's the how's the holy spirit inside of us so we are a live we are living stones uh, that formula formulate a living temple with Yeshua being our cornerstone. We just thank you for, for all of the parallels, for everything that you show us. And we give you honor and glory, and we pray this prayer in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, Amin and Amen. Take a short break. We're going to come back for part two.